サメンライダーエグゼイドこの後スタート I like to think of these videos as something more personal that I got to share with you, the viewer, while also being a storyteller for these shows that we're all passionate about. As we get closer to the end of the Heisei era, I like to look back at the previous writer series. Every show in Heisei Writer has at least an hour long video, with a few exceptions, and there's something to learn that I get to share, whether that be through YouTube algorithms, story structures, or even life lessons, as cheesy as that sounds. Why I'm talking about this now is to not only extend watch time, but also to tell you all that my experience in making these videos helped me analyze these shows a bit better through every series. I skip through so much, especially smaller arcs and details, but、I、also do that in hope of you getting something new out of these shows. And most of all, I hope you get to form your own opinions, because as I always say, your opinion matters more than mine. There are common writers that I never want to talk about again for personal or bad reasons, but those could end up being your absolute favorites. With that being said, Kiria is my favorite character in the show. Kiria had the most chances to shine in the first arc. Yes, the other writers had big parts to play, but Kiria moved a lot of the plot along near its end. Of course, that's because of his death. Still, it was fantastic. The build up, the acting, the action. Episode 13 starts the Emu secret arc. We've had some bits here and there about Emu, such as the doctors talking about a gamer driver compatibility surgery and bringing up how Emu acts differently when he fights. But before we find out what his secret is, we're told that the Bugster virus and doctor writers were made public once Kuroto goes into hiding. And Asuna has a new pink dress. Pink no no Meanwhile, Parado is getting his own gashat done by Kuroto, but it'll take some time. Why does Kuroto look like a Danganronpa character when he transforms? <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, that distracted me. And Parado gives Emu a blank gashat. With it, he becomes Mighty Brothers Level X. <laughs> I completely forgot about the chibi suits. Uh, this one's okay. But once the gamer driver is opened up. The two Mighty Brothers aren't able to work together, and a certain someone says she knows why Emu has a split personality. This is Nico. She's upset that Emu beat her at Tekken a few years ago, and now Taiga babysits her. I probably won't be bringing her up much until the last arc, so just assume she's always by Taiga's side. Is Emu riding on Kiria's corpse? After this fight against Kuroto, Emu gets knocked out, and Taiga takes a bit of his blood as a sample. Taiga finds out that Emu has the game illness, otherwise known as the Bugster virus. My name is Hiro Kagami. And I'm on my way to New York to accept an award I never thought I'd win. What is that award, you ask? It's World's Worst Catchphrase Award. Elsewhere, four beast riders stand in front of a giant villain named King Dark. A man in a snakeskin jacket walks in with a vengeance. This is our next side content Kamen Rider Brave Revive the Beast Rider Squad. Oh my gosh, guys, Kamen Rider is so dark. See how Emu is bleeding? Oh my gosh, that. Uh, that, that actually is kind of dark. <laughs> Each rider has their own dedicated special, as you can see. Last time we had Genmu, and now we have Brave. Genums didn't really feel like his own special since it more so focused on their brand new toys and Legend Rider Pac Man stuff. The Beast Rider Squad special does focus on Hiro. He's a main character and he beats up the evil riders. Plus, Beast for some reason. Well, what about this guy? He's a good guy. His name is literally Beast. I had to have him. However, I am a good guy. Shut up. I'm speaking for you. Though, this is all I can say. Like, it's super short and it just showcases some returning writers in suit and also a Sakura from Kamen Rider Ryuki. <laughs> Plus, a new toy. Night of Safari! It's okay. The animal top is silly. Of 
Wow, uh, I really thought I'd have more to say, but turns out I only have like a sentence worth. Uh, we can put this in the pile of watch if you're curious, but not necessary. There is something neat at the end, though. Yeah, it went pretty great. None of them thought to look past the hologram. <laughs> Here comes a new challenger! So episode 15 gives us a lot of explanations of the past, also a scene where Nico can't transform. Who's he? Bam, bam, shoot, ding, yeah. I'd tell you the exposition, but I'll save that for a certain scene with Kuroto coming up soon. Remember when Parado was waiting to get his own gashat? It's finally done, and since he's a bugster, he can transform into Kamen Rider Paradox, level 50. Perfect puzzle. What stage? To the glory in the chain. Perfect puzzle. That's Paradox as in Para Dash DX. That is so, so clever, Common Rider. I just. <sighs> this suit's okay. I kinda like it, especially the blue, but I think the wide chest and squished helmet here are a little weird. I get that's the point since perfect puzzle. It's a Puyo Puyo knockoff, but still. His other form using Knockout Fighter is pretty cool though. Knockout Fighter! Duel up! Explosion hit! Knockout Fighter! I really like that standby jingle. The, the strong fist, fist, fist round one. Rocket Rock fire. fire! Oh, that's that's so fun. Glory in the the episodes seem to fly by a bit faster, now that we have more serialization with the focus story. Kind of. I'm not touching upon it too much at the moment, though characters throughout this arc are piecing together Emu's backstory. It might seem obvious of what the big reveal is going to be, but I think the show does well enough to push you at a certain conclusion without outright telling you. In between all that, Nico becomes a patient of the week when she first pretends to be infected, and then actually does get infected which is a cool way to tell this kind of story. Her episodes delve more into Emu and his genius gamer M persona that made him the ultimate gamer. Is that an unintentional Danganronpa reference? I hope so, because otherwise I'd be two Danganronpa references in one video, and that just exceeds my quota, so uh, moving on. Or not moving on, because I realize I'm getting to the part where I've been wanting to procrastinate for a while, because... Uh, <laughs> I, I've been kind of avoiding talking about Emu in the first arc, mostly because I just don't have anything to say about him. And that can be continued here other than the part where we're figuring out a secret. As a character, I find Emu boring, but that can come with the territory of being the main protagonist. The other writers had loads of focus with great backstories and interactions, so Emu is here to take in the information and react to it next to Poppy. You could say the same thing about other main writers, which is why I'm not counting this as a negative. And more importantly, the characterization isn't really needed. Emu is a kind soul who cares about his patients. That's all we need. It's what we see. And it's good. The interesting part is that he has another personality with the genius gamer M. And that's it. One of the best episodes that showcases Emu as a whole is episode 17, a non-standard bugster. Uh, that, that's the title of the episode, I'm not asking a rhetorical question. <laughs> Emma learns about the power of friendship as he makes friends with a hamburger bugster. But Kuroto and Parado won't let us have nice things, so the Great Pumpkin is destroyed forever. You monster! The Great Pumpkin was loved by children around the world! The only good pumpkins are the ones in spice lattes! It's a very fun episode with surprisingly a lot of emotion and marketing. Choo -choo! Normally, I wouldn't bring up an episode like this, but hey, I'm sure a lot of you wanted me to talk about this, so here you go. Truthfully, I was thinking about just playing the entirety of the Exeter Bridge episode, but uh, I like I said, I'm sure you guys wanted me to bring it up. It's Super Burger time! Once we get people papa bread! People papa lettuce! People papa heart attack! <laughs> and then you have... Juju Burger! <gasps> He's a pumpkin.
And now for the biggest episode plot-wise. The doctor riders arrive to fight off Kuroto, but the virus-infected dangerous zombie is strong enough to take them all down. Back at CR, Taiga suspects Kuroto of making a new gashat with his evolved power, and that Emu should refrain from transforming since his body is starting to fall under stress. Taiga's suspicion is right, since Kuroto took the Bang Bang shooting gashat during their last fight, and creates the Gashat Gear Dual Beta. I think the virus is starting to get to Kuroto's head here because he starts to spew on and on about being the game master and creating the ultimate plan for Bugsters and games to fall under him. What a weirdo. Kuroto unleashes the Gear Duel Beta's game, Tattle Fantasy. Most games are quickly explained when they're first introduced, and you can also deduce the gist of it, like how Mighty Action X is a simple platformer like Mario or Kirby, and Tattle Quest is like a Zelda adventure game. Tattle Fantasy is a game where you play as a villain to take down the hero, and that's a game I'd love to try out. The Tattle Fantasy monster takes out Emu easily, and Kuroto absorbs a bugster for the fun of it. Laughing evilly about how bugsters are beneath him, Parados had enough of Kuroto's ego and turns on him. That just makes Kuroto angry, so now he's going to reveal the secret that everyone knew but kept hidden from Emu. The doctor riders run towards Kuroto and yell at him to stop, but it's too late. Kuroto reveals the secret of Emu. <laughs> Emu is patient zero of the Bugster virus. With this knowledge, Emu starts to fall under stress, knocking him out. In an earlier episode and in the movie, it was explained to us that Zizen experimented on Emu, but it went wrong, causing the new infection. The constant use of Mighty Brothers Double X was breaking down Emu's body more and more. But Emu's resolve to protect his patient's smile was too strong for him to stop. Now that he knows he's patient zero, Emu falls into self-doubt, not knowing how he can save his patients if he was a root cause of their illness. Emu's secret is revealed, thus ending this arc. Wait. Why aren't we getting to the next title sequence? This would have been a great way to end the arc. Oh, okay, well, we still have... Six? Uh, six episodes to go in this part. We're back to the patient of the week formula, and as mentioned, Emu starts having self-doubt. And that's basically all I can say. <laughs> I don't think the episodes are a drag here since the action and characters are still compelling, but the pacing does start to fall off. What exemplifies this even more is that in the immediate next fight against Kuruto in the next episode, Hiro just snatches away the Gashat Gear Dual Beta. No crazy plan, or even punching Kuroto really, really hard, Hiro just takes it. Oh, sorry, Hiro makes the Tattle Fantasy monster use a confusion item, and then he takes it. Anyway, here's Conrider Bray with Tattle Fantasy. Tattle Fantasy! It's cool. And in the next episode, Taiga uses the Gashad's Bang Bang Simulation section. What the heck? Uh, the, this just looks weird. Are, are we done yet? Episode 21 reveals that the Bugster virus came from Y2K. If you're too young to know what that is, then uh, ask your parents. Okay, the next episode has something I can actually talk about. In this one, Hiro gets hold of Kiria's laptop. On it, he finds a project about reprogramming DNA strands. Meanwhile, Kuroto's base is discovered and raided by... Uh, I think they're police? They say they're from the Ministry of Health, but they just so happen to be able to conduct a police raid? Well, Kuroto's bugster virus starts to affect him like any other person and he's taken to CR. Naturally, the doctor riders are wary of curing him, but Emu steps up. Despite everything Kuroto's done, he's still a patient. Now that Kuroto's infected, his plans have failed. What plan could that be? Kuroto reveals everything. In the year 2000, Kuroto was helping his dad, Masamune Dan, create video games, all of which you see as gashats. Kuroto was a child prodigy. He did it all. Until one day, he received a letter from a young Emu with an idea for a video game. However, this upsets Kuroto. 
seeing someone out there that was better than him. So with the Bugster virus born from Y2K, Kuroto sent Emu a video game containing the infection. Does this mean Dan Kuroto sent a child anthrax over jealousy? Years later, Kuroto sent Zaizen to experiment on the growing virus inside Emu. Naturally, Emu is upset at all this, and while he's not going to fight his patient, he didn't say anything about the genius gamer M fighting a villain. Some fighting later, and a half-naked Kuroto reveals that he infected himself on purpose when his base was raided. He was waiting for the right moment as his plan is nearly complete. <laughs> he walks back into Genmu Corporation and takes his rightful seat as CEO. From the beginning of the first arc, we see Conrader Genmu trying to gather data from the writers and then later absorbing bugsters. There were a few times where we saw the game Common Rider Chronicle. Kuroto brought this up every once in a while as his goal to create the ultimate game. In episode 18, he explains that this is a game where civilians turn into riders and fight for survival. It sounds like fun on the surface, but you know he had sinister undertones. That synopsis could be taken literally. Kuroto destroyed Emu's gamer driver in their previous fight, and Emu is starting to lose hope since he was so trusting in his patient. Hiro's research on Kiria's computer is complete, and Hiro gives Emu a new resolve. In another confrontation with Kuroto, Hiro throws Emu an empty gashat, and Kiria's old gamer driver. Emu created Mighty Brothers Double X from within himself. It wasn't a game that Kuroto made, so Emu can do it again. The reason why Kiria was killed was because he discovered Emu was patient zero before anyone else. In a way, Kiria was protecting Emu from afar. Hiro says Kiria trusted in Emu to save them all. Now with his evolved resolve, Emu creates a new game. Maximum Mighty X, level 99. I am Gundam! With this new power, Emu can take away Dangerous Zombie's ability to revive himself. Kuroto is nearly defeated, but Emu won't kill him. So Kuroto tries to transform again. Nothing. Parado arrives and decides to do what Emu won't. What's wrong? I thought you were a god, Mr. Game Master. And tell the bike I said, fuck you. You won't get away with this D-pad. I'll be the greatest meme you'll ever know. You're going to know why my father has an Australian accent. It's because... <sighs> Kuroto is killed and Parado is left to finish what he started, taking over with Kamen Rider Chronicle. That was episode 23, and it's basically the end of the Emu secret arc. But we do have one more episode, and this sets up way more than expected. Patient of the week, yada yada. More importantly, we see a new face in CR. It's Genom Corporation's new CEO, Amagasaki Ren. He was mentioned in a previous episode, so this didn't come out of nowhere. Ren asks Poppy to help with her game, but she refuses, so Ren hypnotizes her, causing her to sing? Uh, at least it's a good song that I'll touch upon later. Dang, how many things am I saving at this point? Elsewhere, Parado finds a hideout and summons bugsters of all kinds, including his old pal Graphite. Ren arrives with Poppy, and now the bugster gang is all here. With ten bugsters combined, Kamen Rider Chronicle is now complete, thus ending the Emu secret arc. Wait, who's this? Yo, Shella Key! What the hell is that? I sure am high! Do a backflip! Don't jump! I'm gonna jump! Whoa! I wish I died! I feel like I'm gonna lock you in my basement one day. Cool. Before I go, wanna be in a movie? I'm taking that as a yes. See you in Cho Superhero Tyson Abridged! Yeah! Um, Emu? Do you even know what that is? Nope. Spaceships from the video game Zevia start to attack the city, and Uchu Sentai Kiranger is called upon to help. Due to the attack, Amu from Dobotsu Sentai Zhuoger is taken to CR to receive help from Emu and Poppy. She's a furry. Do we operate on her or call a vet? Leading to our next big event, Chol Superhero Tyson. 
Cho is normally translated to super, since it means the next step up or something to that equivalent. In English, the title could literally be Super Superhero Tyson, but I've also seen it as Super Duper Hero Tyson, and with a title like this, I think I'll go with the original Japanese name, Cho Superhero Tyson. This is the fifth, and at the time, final Superhero Tyson movie, as Toei wanted to focus on other yearly projects. In this movie, a game called Cho Superhero Tyson summons heroes and villains to participate in a tournament. Oh man, where's Japanese Adam Sandler when you need him? What the f is that? One returning character leaves Emu surprised, and another character looks just like Hito. Just kiss already! Inside the game, we meet a boy named Eight, who has connections to this other true Hito. Having two Hito sounds a bit confusing, so originally, true Hito was going to have a different hair color, but that would have clashed with the actor's real life image. The Hito from this game is officially called True Brave or True Hito, which is why I'm saying it, even if it sounds a little out there. True Hito. Huh. <laughs> Speaking of Hito, this basically is a Hito story as he discovers the true meaning of friendship. Previous superhero Tyson movies focused on only a small group of characters as they happen to run into cameos. It's like that here, but with a much bigger cast and more varied crossovers, which I don't mind, mostly because I don't feel lost like I did with previous movies. The main story really is about Hiro, but we also have Poppy and Naga from Q-Ranger, plus Emu participating in the tournament with some guest cameos. Amu also tags along with Hiro, and I think that is just super adorable. This movie's okay. I don't hate it, I don't think it's the worst, nor is it the best superhero Tyson movie. At the very least, as I say with every single superhero Tyson movie, it's a fun time and the crossover matchups are cool to see. We even have a Parado Taiga scene, which if you're a shipper of them, uh, congrats on your few scenes that you have with them together. In fact, I don't even think we have that in the main show, so here's your interaction. As part of the main tournament, Emu chooses his team and we get some personal favorites of mine, Kitaoka from Ryuki, Momotaro from Dano, Yakumo from Ninja, and Jin from Go Busters. It's a very random selection, but I think it's cool to see them all together. This particular scene was all over the marketing, and the press conference made them out to be a much bigger part of the movie. But they're barely here, and at this point, that's more funny to me than anything. Like, it's just this one scene and another with Momotaro. They still voice themselves in suit, and that's how we see them for a majority of the screen time. Normally, I'd be disappointed, but hey, I I'm an adult now, and things like this don't exactly bother me anymore. I'm having fun with what time we have spent with them. Plus, Ryuki does get more love later down in other seasons. But those are with other characters, and Kitaoka is only seen here, so gotta take what you can get. The tournament itself includes some fun callbacks, like their tournament screen showing all these different teams, such as Team Jiro and Team Takaiwa, made up of characters Jiro Okamoto and Seiji Takaiwa suit acted for. Kamrader Genmu is also here, but I'm gonna assume that's a game version since he has like, one line. Other cameos include the Conrader Amazons from the 2017 show, since Amazon Neo makes his on-screen debut here. They're not as violent as in their respective shows, and they're not at each other's throats, so these are just game versions. And that's cool, I guess? Another interesting cameo is Uchi from Juden Sentai Kiryuji, and he's using a different changer that came from Power Rangers Dino Force Brave, also known as Kiryuji Brave. You can tell there were several projects going on that Toei wanted to promote, and you can't forget the Bandai Namco collaboration. Uh, Shocker is here too. Wasn't exactly sure how to say that naturally, but they're here. They they sure are. Who was that guy? This movie can be put under the watch if you're curious pile, cause it's a fun time, but it has nothing to do with the main show. Well, let's put an asterisk there, cause you might want to watch Chosubhiro Tyson if you want to continue 
with the next project. Emu wakes up in an unfamiliar place, an amusement park in the sky. After some time, he runs into some common riders. What the? Why are you wearing sunglasses indoors? However, all of them have something in common. Spoiler warning here for Con Rider Agito, Blade, and Gaim as we enter the follow up to Cho Superhero Tyson known as Common Sentai Go Rider. Emu starts to feel like he's met these riders before, except for one small issue Kiria is here, even though he's supposed to be dead. You're not another video game character, are you? One question at a time, dude. If you really missed me, you could have bought my t shirt. So that can only mean. These other writers are also dead. Each writer gets a short flashback of their death scenes from their respective shows, and they even say their writer names Kaito Kumon, Conrider Baron, Yoko Minato, Conrider Marika, Kenzaki Kazma, Conrider Blade, and Kaoru Kino, Conrider Another Agito. Fun fact this is the first time he's been referred to as Another Agito in universe, since in the original Agito series, he is just known as Agito, or the other Agito. Agito squared? Agito 2? Agi Poppy is here too. Don't worry about it. Since these writers are dead, a couple of them start to turn on Emu, since he's supposedly alive. But then shocker monsters attack, as they do. Ultimately, Emu finds out that he's been in this other world before, but his memory keeps getting reset. <laughs> He wakes up in the real world and decides to go back to save the writers. With his memory reset once again, the dead writers reintroduce themselves, but Emu is hesitant when it comes to Kenzaki. It's revealed that this was all a ploy by Dan Kuroto. His plan to annoy Emu for all eternity was going well until Emu read up on Kenzaki in the Conrider wiki. Kenzaki isn't actually dead in the traditional sense. He is actually an undead, still walking among the living. The real Kenzaki was helping out in the real world to stop Kuroto's plan. During the final fight, we get to see a biblically accurate Conrider Genmu and the namesake of this miniseries, the Common Sentai Go Riders. <laughs> Kuroto is defeated, but the riders hold Emu back as they sacrifice themselves to have Emu and Kenzaki return to their real world. Oh, oh, what the f Is it hailing? God damn, I hate Los Angeles weather. Man, what a cool miniseries. Returning actors, an interesting mystery, fun twists. It's just really, really boring. You'd think this would be one of my favorite writer projects ever, with some of my favorite characters, some of the best action, some of the most interesting mysteries, but... <laughs> It was just really slow, and I was bored for most of it. I do like the ideas. Having a cameo as old as Kino is great for the older fans, and he even has a remade suit since the older suit was basically destroyed. Plus seeing Gaim representation so soon is fun. And yeah, I think the Kenzaki stuff is probably the best part. I point towards Blade as having the best ending in all of Kamen Rider, so having a small continuation without it affecting the Blade story is awesome too. Kiria is also here. But man, the pacing is so slow. I get it's trying to be mysterious and all, but I don't think we needed 5 minutes of Emu on the amusement park rides for so long, or these shots that just linger on forever. The writing is also a little weird because the characters keep repeating themselves with information we already knew in a single sentence. Like when they were first introduced to Emu and he's like, oh my gosh, are you guys dead? Yes, we're dead. No way, I can't believe I'm alive and you're the opposite of dead. Actually, I think I'm alive and you're all dead. That's kind of how the interaction feels. It just, <laughs> you, you get it. And the Go Rider stuff is okay, I think. I didn't bring this up because I was waiting to bring it up more here specifically, but in Cho Superhero Tyson, Team XA's reward for the tournament was the ability to become Common Sentai Go Rider, a mashup of Super Sentai and Common Rider. It was neat to do this, so making it into a miniseries sounds even better. 
except one issue I have is that this didn't need to be called Common Sentai Go Rider. The Go Rider powers only come in during the final battle. That's it. The expectations of naming the series this way makes me think of something fun with a cameo team, and we don't get that. Actually, there is something I love from this miniseries, and this miniseries alone. The music. Oh my gosh, the music is so good, like you have no idea. I've been searching for its OST for a very long time, but the only way I could get it was through Apple Music Japan. So I asked for a few favors and was able to get the Cho Superhero Tyson and Go Rider's OST. Man, I can play certain tracks from Go Rider on repeat. Forever. Cause they're that good. Okay, that's probably enough for now. We're about halfway through the main series, but we're nowhere near finished. Now, let's get into the Common Rider Chronicle arc. Actually, while we're in between the show, there's something I should talk about that's been kind of an elephant in the room for a while. If you watch through History of Wizard and Ghost, I've been including clips of the shows with English parody dubs, even more so here. This is something I'm doing rarely in the History of Conrader series, talking about myself and my other projects. Since these videos typically go outside my usual audience, you may or may not know of my other project, x Abridged. Back during the early episodes of x I wanted to make an abridged series. No idea why, I'm just a guy who wants to do a little bit of everything, I guess. And yeah, I probably should have waited till the show was done, and the original cut doesn't really hold up in my opinion. Mostly since I was still stuck in those early 2000s humor days, for better and for worse. I think it was a year and a half long project, with over 10 episodes, plus covering the specials and movies, with lots of copyright IDs. But it was so much fun. The voice actors, my friends, they were great, and they poured their all into my weird scripts. Unfortunately, all the episodes had to go down. However, Icon on Twitter, as well as a few others, asked if I still had the series. The support was great, so I recut x Bridge, and now it's up as Emma's Bizarre Adventure. I'm actually really surprised by how much support it got in the first place because to this day I still see some of my lines and weird voices uh, <laughs> referenced here and there, whether it's, whether it's on Reddit or Twitter, and it's actually really humbling. Like I, I'm, I'm actually surprised that, that that's still going on. <laughs> we did have a lot of plans to keep it going, and I mean a lot of plans. It might have even been one of my main video series at that point. Let's see, uh, x Bridge Plus was originally going to be some stories written by the cast and myself, some, uh, some audio dramas that I really liked. I, uh, Mads McCool actually had a really neat idea for a, a board game themed writer that the rest of the cast had to, like, go up against. Special Form 12 had these what-if scenarios that could be audio dramas, and I think they'd be taken a little more seriously. I don't think they'd be exactly, like, x Bridge parodies, but... Still, I think you guys would have had fun with them. I even had ideas or drafts thought up for um for artwork that I would commission. Of course, I was going to continue on with the other movies and specials too. I even wanted a Mighty Novel X uh, video at one point. <laughs> and as you could tell from the Heisei Generations part of this video that a lot of it was recorded. It was only missing like a couple of voice actors. But at that point, a lot of the videos went down and I just gave up on it. I had scripts written for the True Ending trilogy, like all of it, but I just don't know what happened to it. Like, I swear it was done. Like, the script for all three movies into, like, one, it was entirely done, but I don't know where it is, and I tried looking for it. Like, I swear, but if I ever find it again, I'll I'll be sure to share it, whether it's, like, on Patreon or something. Same thing for the true ending, I believe. Yeah, a lot of it was recorded, too. I just don't have a lot of it anymore. Like, for the most part, I do have everybody's raw audio up until the Heisei Generations thing, but everything else has been, I don't know. It's not exactly lost media, it's just it's just gone, you know? But yeah, ultimately, I originally didn't really plan to talk about all this, but I've had a couple comments bring it up in the first place, or in the first part and on Twitter, so I'd figure I'd say at least a little bit, and of course, big thank you to those who watched and supported x Bridged. The next stage. 
Hello everyone, it's Thomas Jujubi, and man, do I love Kamen Rider x aid but maybe you already knew that. Because this was the first season of Japanese tokusatsu that I got to experience live, everything from the initial rumors, to the first magazine scans, to the press conference, to episode 1, and of course all the other rumors and twists and plot developments of the whole show that followed, so I have a ton of nostalgia for this season. But after I rewatched it for the first time a bit ago, it just solidified my opinions of it being a really damn good show. I love how it takes its time early on to flesh out the characters and the world that they're in, but still makes interesting progressions in the story by introducing mysteries and etc before BAM! The show kicks into the highest gear possible, but it still never really feels like it loses sight of its characters. They still develop and become more interesting just as the plot becomes more intense. And at the same time, I just love watching it, looking at it, the visuals. I love the video game aesthetics and how everything ties into that in different ways, especially those like big screens and the finisher text. I love that stuff. Stuff. The suits all look wild and unique, but still have these little elements that make them super cohesive. Even the small stuff like all the games they use are the games that exist in universe. It's so cool to me. I really love x because it's perfectly balanced. It's a compelling character drama, but it's also filled to the brim with compelling plots and mysteries. It's a goofy, silly kid show made to sell toys, but it also has really interesting commentary about life, death, and what it actually means to be alive. It's messages about how life matters because we only have one of them and how it works with the tokusatsu video game stuff is so smart. x encapsulates everything I love about tokusatsu, creating these awesome worlds and fights and managing to merge it with stories that actually have something important and amazing to say. It's like a cool kid show, but it also really makes me think. Without it, I don't know if I would be the huge fan of the genre that I am today. It's really inspired me and no matter what, it'll always have a special place in my heart. Come in the